Today, we're gonna to be focusing on whose knowledge counts. This is an area very close to my heart. I've spent most of my professional career focusing on issues of citizen voice, participation, power, and how those interact with the <clears throat> policy process and how they shape the nature of evidence and knowledge that are used to bring about policy change. We'd like to interrogate further this relationship of the commonly understood power and knowledge framework. What's the relationship between power and knowledge? We want to explore further the meanings and workings of power through a framework known as the power cube, which has been developed by myself and others here at IDS and has been widely used now and applied for power analysis. We want to then look at how these understandings of power affect strategies for using evidence, for communication, for using knowledge to influence policy and social change, which is the arena where I expect many of you work. And therefore, we want to ask you finally to put yourselves in the picture, to think about how you're using your skills and your, what are your strategies for using evidence to bring about change. Now, what, let's begin by a little exercise. What, what do these three images have in common? The answer may not be obvious, but they all have to do with this commonly used phrase, knowledge is power. On the left-hand side, Francis Bacon, the English philosopher, was the first person to whom this phrase is attributed in the year 1597. Michel Foucault, the French philosopher in the 1990s, wrote a great deal about knowledge and discourse and how knowledge and shaped discourse and discourse and shaped policy and, and, and people's understanding of public issues. But by the years 2018, this phrase had become popularized in a computer game uh, called knowledge is power. But is knowledge power? Let's interrogate that a little bit further. Some people say, no, knowledge isn't power. It's knowledge is power only as it relates to action. Knowledge plus action equal power. Other people say, well, knowledge isn't power. It's the application of knowledge that produces power. It's not the lack of knowledge that's the problem. It's the lack of implementation that's holding us back. In recent years, we've seen, of course, the rise of fake news and debates about what's fact and what's fake. And we've seen powerful evidence or dynamic evidence of how the misinformation and mobilization of disinformation have shaped decision-making and have shaped people's attitudes um, even and shaped even as we've seen recently in the United States, understandings of elections and democracy. People have also said that if knowledge is power and power corrupts, does knowledge corrupt? And perhaps the rise of fake news and misinformation and deliberate disinformation strategies are, a, are examples of the way that knowledge corrupts or knowledge affects power through corrupt practices itself. So if knowledge is power, we need to ask a little bit further, whose knowledge are we talking about? Of course, at IDS, the Robert Chambers um, is famous for his book, Whose Reality Counts, which talks about the important ways in which local knowledge emerges, the, the local, how local people understand their problems as opposed to depending upon expert knowledge. We need to think about how do we mobilize knowledge to challenge unjust power. And of course, in the movements around the world to decolonize development, it's also about decolonizing thinking and rethinking whose knowledge is used to inform our decision-making and our policies. And what do we mean by power anyway? That's been a long, a highly contested fee, uh, concept in the development field. So let's turn our mind to understanding that a bit more. At IDS, as I mentioned, we've developed this sort of, uh, this, this approach called the power cube. It's modeled after the Rubik's cube. And I'm sure many of you are aware of the, the Rubik's cube. These can, I don't know if you can see that, it seems to be, light seems to be blotting it out, but um, you try to line up the dots 
make all the colors align and that's that's the game it this analogy tries to sh show link that that game to to understanding power if you've ever tried to do the Rubik's cube, you know how difficult it is. You know there's multiple combinations. And in fact, the mathematicians tell us there are several quadrillion, however many that is, quadrillion different forms or ways in which those, those blocks can misalign. But they also tell us that any 18 or 20 moves can line up those different colors, which suggests, I uh, don't want to carry this too far, which suggests that if we're clearer about how we want to use evidence and how, and how power affects evidence and how we want to use evidence to challenge policy, we need to understand further these different interactions and how we might line up our strategies across the Rubik's Cube. So we understand the Rubik's Cube uh, in terms of power, the power cube by looking at forms of power the spaces in which power operates and the levels in which powers operate. And each of these we suggest has implications for how we link evidence to policy and to change. If you go to powercube.net, you also see the rendition of the power cube this way, the interacting between the levels, spaces and forms. Even though this is displayed in a static way, you have to think that these are constantly interacting and changing. We could begin by understanding any of these as an entryway into the, these interactions, but let's begin by understanding what we mean by forms of power. How do we understand power? Well, political scientists for years have understood power by looking at its visible forms. They say we can understand who has power in policymaking by looking at who participates in policymaking processes and in the parliaments and in, in the committees and in the public debates. And by saying who participates and who predominates, who wins or who loses, we can determine who has power in affecting the outcomes of policy, policy change. But other Political scientists have challenged this view, in particular Stephen Lukes, who was my supervisor at Oxford many years ago, wrote his book, Power, A Radical View, said that no, power is not just about what happens in the public arena. Power is the ability to keep certain issues, certain interests, certain voices out of the public arena in the first place. It's not just who sits at the table and who dominates the conversation at the table. It's about keeping people from getting to that policy table at all. So we have to understand power in its visible forms, but power in its hidden forms, that being in the way that it keeps certain voices and issues from emerging altogether. And finally, Luke said that actually the most insidious use of power though isn't simply about controlling the debate or who wins in the debate. It's about keeping debates from happening at all. It's what we call invisible power. When common beliefs and norms are internalized or there's lack of awareness, which means that people learn to accept an unjust status quo and certain issues or inequities simply go unquestioned. Now we can see many forms of this. We can see how gender uh, lens for many years, we, women oftentimes were, were taught that they had to accept what men said or accept a certain position in the, in the household. More recently, we might take the issue of climate change, which for years was invisible in the common eye. There was very little thought about it or people didn't believe that this was a real thing that was happening. And it was only through mobilizing evidence and action that climate change increasingly became more visible and gradually began to get to the policy arenas. So you have to understand change is moving across this spectra of making visible the invisible, of making visible the hidden, and then also of looking at once issues emerge to the public arena, whose voice, whose knowledge, whose evidence predominates to win the public debates on those issues. But how power happens, and it, depending on, on, on that, um, how we understand power, these different forms will affect the strategies for, for action. 
and for using evidence. If we are focusing on the visible power, then the, the, that public arena, then some of those theories that James gave us the first lecture about the instrumental view that we, about how evidence can lead to policy change. And we mobilize knowledge and expertise to engage policymakers directly with the thought that simply evidence in those public arena might affect or change the outcomes. But if we see that power is about hidden power, it's about keeping certain issues off of the table, then you can't simply mobilize evidence for policymakers because those, it isn't yet on the policymakers agenda. There we have to think about how we use evidence in plus action, plus mobilization to affect policy change. So it means using evidence to support actors to bring in hidden voices, hidden forms of knowledge to surface those issues which aren't receiving public attention and to put them in the public arena. But if we're concerned about invisible power, it's not only about evidence, it's not only about mobilization and action, it's about changing understanding, about changing awareness about which issues are important in the first place and who has the right to address them. So mob mobilizing knowledge for awareness to challenge values, to challenge paradigms, to challenge existing discourses. And as we develop evidence and if we communicate, we can think about each of these forms of bringing about change and ask ourselves, which strategy are we using? Who's the audience? What theory of change are we using uh, in, 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 as we try to affect policy and social change through our knowledge and evidence? But secondly, the power cube argues that actually which forms of knowledge do, and of power predominate depends on the spaces that we're concerned about, the spaces of power. We can think about a space as an arena for participation, uh, an opening, a, a, a place, a committee room, a, an opportunity for engagement. And we similarly think about a spectrum across three kinds of spaces. First of all, they're the closed spaces. Those are the cl those behind the scenes committee rooms, those board rooms, those, those hidden spaces where decisions are made behind closed doors without any broad consultation or participation. And we can think of many places where that's still the case. But increasingly people have been challenging closed door decision-making, particularly in democracies, and say, we want to ask, we want to have more consultation. And we see as a result, many places which we think of as invited spaces, where people are being asked to participate in public arenas through consultative processes, through either online or offline, through public meetings, through forms of participatory uh, democracy and, 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 and engagement, uh, deliberative democracy, different kinds of forums that bring in the views of multiple people to deliberate and think about policy change. But finally, we think that there's what we call claim spaces. These are the spaces that are outside of those formal processes. These are the spaces where marginalized groups and less powerful groups, no matter how far away they sit from those policy making processes are setting their own agenda or having their own conversations or using their own forms of knowledge. This can occur informally in small spaces in at the community well or in local barber shops or in people's households where the knowledge that is being used and shared may actually be quite distant from the formal knowledge or the, the knowledge that's being shared within those closed committee rooms. Or it can happen through more visibilized forms of, of direct engagement through the emergence of protest and social movements, which we've been seeing increasingly, where people use knowledge to demand that certain issues get put on the agenda, that their voices get heard because they're not coming up appropriately through the invited spaces or in other policy making processes. So each of these spaces for engagement also implies a different strategy for change and use of evidence. If we're concerned about opening closed spaces, then we use evidence and knowledge to monitor those spaces, to hold actors to account, to insist on transparency, 
And certainly journalists and others have done, and NGOs and civil society have put a lot of emphasis over the recent decades on making public authority more transparent and more accountable. But if we're also concerned about how we strengthen these invited spaces, these public spaces for deliberation in which multiple voices come together, then we want to use our knowledge and evidence to support the ability of various groups to dialogue, to deliberate, to use knowledge more effectively, to recognize multiple forms of knowledge and bring them into bear for policy decision-making. But if we're concerned about those issues and voices that aren't yet in those public arenas, we want to think about how we strengthen those claim spaces. We want to think about how we use knowledge and evidence to, to build the legitimacy of new voices, to make more visible these suppressed uh, forms of knowledge, or to deepen and support strategies for mobilization where people are are putting on demanding action through protests or social movements or in their own spaces, using perhaps different evidence, different forms of knowledge to about what's important and, and which issues they would like to have addressed. And in reality, of course, change happens by linking across all of these, by bringing the claim spaces to the attention of the invited spaces by demanding that those people behind closed doors also become more public and engage with those other spaces of change. But where power happens these days, of course, appearance on the level or where decision-making is happening or which policies we're trying to influence depends upon the levels of which we're working. We live in a globalized world which has multiple layers of power and authority. As people who have written, power is no longer linked to territory. We have to look across different, different levels of power in order to bring about change. In development, we oftentimes think about the global forms of power. We think about the, the global institutions, the bilaterals, the multilaterals, the multinationals, the UN, the WHO, and others. And our evidence is used to inform policy making at that level. A lot of evidence is used to try to focus on national level policy to influence the agendas of governments, parliaments, political parties, coalitions, usually linked to nation states. But increasingly, of course, we recognize the importance of local forms of action, of local governments and authorities, councils and associations, and the value of local knowledge in order to make the policies national and global more real. But as feminists have reminded us, um, all these global, national, and local policies um, are mediated at the micro level. They're mediated within the household, where real power decisions are, are exercised outside of the public sphere, but helps to shape which policies really have change and grounding at the, lo the local level in an everyday life. A good example of this, for instance, is some work that we've been doing with partners in Pakistan that have been looking at the take up of vaccines um, around COVID. Now, like many countries, Pakistan is rolling out with global support. They're rolling out a national policy um, of, of, vaccine, of vaccine take up and distrib distribution, working closely with local and subnational governments and associations. But what we found at the household level in doing surveys with women was that only 10% of women thought that they would be able to choose which vaccine they would take or whether they would take a vaccine at all without getting the permission of the men in their household. So we could look at power in all these public arenas, but none of that would really matter without also trying to understand at the micro level whose voices are being heard and whose knowledge will be shape, used to shape what actually occurs. So if we're concerned about these different levels of power would also, these each will affect the strategies we're using for knowledge, uh, for change, for determining which evidence we think is important. If we start at the household level, we want to look at knowledge at uh, the very micro level and look at evidence of what's actually happening in everyday life. If we start at the more local community level um, and local government level, we want to like Robert Chambers reminded us to focus on local knowledge and to understand 
local realities and how local knowledge can inform public policies and use our evidence to, to, to document uh, those local forms of knowledge. If we're focusing on the national policies, we oftentimes are looking at the interactions of experts and NGOs and other policy influencers and how their multiple forms of evidence are, are shaping those national policies. But all of these in turn are shaped by global knowledge networks and global epistemic communities. And of course, just like the other dimensions of the power cube, each of these levels interact with the other. The evidence at the global level, which evidence and whose knowledge is considered important may affect what happens at a national level. What happens at a national level may affect local knowledge, but vice versa, what happens locally can be used to influence national in an upward process and a bottom-up process, what happens locally using local knowledge, using surfacing suppressed and, and marginalized forms of knowledge can bring about change at the national level and can use, interact with global forms of global institutions as well. So our strategy for change has to look across each of these levels and the evidence at each is important to occur, to, to affect um, policies and, and the in, impact of those policies on people's everyday life. So that really brings us to the question of where do you spend your time and your energy? As I understand it, those of you signing up for these course, this course are probably uh, communicators, you're knowledge workers, you're mobilizing knowledge and evidence in order to bring about change. It, it's incredibly important, a role that you play. But where are you concentrating your time? Where are you using your energies? What's your real theory of change? Where do you think change is going to happen and that your time and energy can be best used? Are you focusing on those global debates in the public arena? Or are you down here focusing on those invisible forms of knowledge at the more local arena? Are you trying to mobilize and bring the hidden forms of knowledge, the discounted forms of knowledge, the misunderstood or not understood realities upward the chain to make them visible to national and global policymakers? Are you using your skills to monitor and hold to account those people sitting behind closed doors and, and demanding accountability through evidence? Or are you using your evidence to strengthen the, those who engage in invited spaces to, to improve the quality of discourse and dialogue and public decision making? Or are you linking your evidence to those people who are claiming their own voices through protests and social movements? Or are you trying to bring the, that knowledge and those voices into the other policy processes. It's very difficult to do these by yourselves, to reach across all of these places by yourselves, but the role that you play with others is very, very important. Of course, what we've learned about the power cube is that really transformative change doesn't happen just by approaching one dimension or one block or the other, just like the power cube itself. We have to link our strategies across all sides and all sides of the cube. And that means, as I've said, connecting across the spaces, using knowledge and evidence to connect those voices from the claim spaces to the invite spaces to the, to the closed spaces. We have to mobilize, we have to link horizontally across those spaces, but we also have to link vertically to use our evidence, to bring in evidence from global, national, local, even household forms of, of knowing. And in all of those, whether across those spaces and forms, we have to recognize that some forms of knowledge are more visible than others. And the role of evidence can perhaps best be served by bringing into the visible debates, the more hidden and invisible forms of knowledge which if they aren't used, if they aren't made public, will mean that public policy by itself is limited because it's only being based on the knowledge of a few whose knowledge is privileged in public spaces 
and whose and multiple other forms of knowledge and evidence remain marginalized and outside an informed policy making process. So evidence can be very important in challenging power, in shape in developing more inclusive forms of policy making and participation. And in a globally diverse world, it's through that inclusion of multiple forms of knowledge and evidence that we think change will really happen at a transformative level. If you're interested in these themes, then you can go to these readings here. Um, there, that uh, most of them are in open access, or you can go to the powercube.net itself, where there's dozens and dozens of resources 